The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenant seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, so uh, let's just say it. This is an icky parable. You know, I'd really hope to have something nice and easy and sweet for my last sermon with you. This has been just a lovely last couple of months covering for Pastor Seth while he's been on sabbatical. I've really enjoyed my time. But, you know what? This is what we got. (laughs) Thank you, lectionary. It is definitely the most violent and, I'd say, confusing of all Jesus' parables. And he kind of leaves the point a little unclear. I mean, what should happen to these terrible tenants? He doesn't say. Why did the landowner keep sending people to be abused and killed? What is the real point of this parable besides threats and death? Just too many murders and questions in there for me. And we also have to be honest and admit that this parable has been misinterpreted and misused in pretty terrible ways. Here's how the traditional interpretation goes. God is the landowner, the one who plants the vineyard and builds the tower and everything. It's building off that poetic imagery that we heard in the reading from Isaiah 5. The vineyard, in this traditional interpretation, is the kingdom of God on earth, God's mission. You could even say God's God's people or, or God's church. The tenants are the people responsible for living out God's kingdom and mission on earth. In this time, in Jesus' day, it would be the Israelites, the Jews. And the murdered son, of course, is Jesus, sent to turn the tenants back from their evil ways. He is, of course, the stone that the builders, and in this interpretation, that means the Jews, rejected. Do you see the potential harm that this interpretation might create? Much oppression and violence against Jews has been fomented by this very parable because of this traditional interpretation. The Jews are blamed for killing Jesus, and then Christians get to see themselves as the true and good tenants of the vineyard, the ones who will produce good fruit only. And Jesus' words are taken as permission to persecute, harm, and even kill people of the Jewish faith. All bad. All very, 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 very bad. So, let's not go there, (laughs) because even though 
Jesus is talking to the Jewish re religious leaders of his day, and he is critiquing their leadership. This isn't just a blanket condemnation of their religion, a religion which Jesus was a part of and a member of, remember, and he had no plans to change his status with them. What Jesus said to the religious people, the religious leaders of his day, he is also saying to us in our time and place as well. So just what exactly is it that he's saying here? Here's what is going on at the heart of this parable, what it's ultimately about. It is about what happens when we confuse our roles of tenant versus owner. The tenants in this story, the ones who perpetuate all the unnecessary violence, have forgotten or ignored, ignored this simple fact. They are not the owners of the vineyard. They are simply the tenant farmers, charged with caring for the land and bringing in the harvest and in return, keeping a share of that harvest, but giving most of it to the owner of the land. This was a common practice in the ancient world as it still is today. The tenant farmers knew how this was supposed to work. They knew that they weren't the owners, but for some reason, call it greed, ambition, sin, the lure of profit, they decided that it was okay to act like the owner. They wanted to keep the produce and the benefits, even the whole place, the inheritance of this vineyard that they didn't own all for themselves. And with their actions, they decided that they would do whatever was necessary in order to make it so. Let's be real, folks. We kind of do the same thing. I mean, we don't usually go out and murder people who get in our way. But maybe in small ways, we do perpetuate violence in a system. We too live in a society that pri prioritizes profit over almost everything else. Think about corporations and the ridiculously huge salaries they generate for their CEOs. And these corporations are celebrated and their stocks are obsessed over and they're given basically a tax-free existence in many places, while the hourly employees who do the actual day-to-day -day work are barely making ends meet. These owners of companies have forgotten what they really are, merely tenants. They, even if they're called owners, they really are caretakers of the gifts that God has granted. They're not the creators, they're not the originators, they are caretakers. And in their confused state, their wrong-headedness, they trample on those who actually deserve a larger share of the profits. You can think the same way with our planet, our environment. We as human beings have confused our role as tenant with owner. And boy, have we taken advantage of that gift, haven't we? Same thing happens in our government. I mean, did you see the debate on Tuesday? Someone, won't say any names, but someone has forgotten that he is merely the tenant of that big house in the other Washington, the caretaker of this country, and all, all who call it home. He doesn't see it as a gift to lead this country. He has wrapped his arms around it like a two-year-old with a toy. He doesn't want to give up, just yelling, mine, 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 mine. But our elected officials are merely caretakers of our precious democracy. And the good ones know that. 
and lead with a servant heart of gratitude and generosity. Are any of them perfect? No. <laughs> but some definitely know what to do more than others. And you know what? The same thing happens in our churches. When we forget whose church this really is, who it is who owns our buildings, our ministries, our programs, our mission statements, even our hearts, when we decide to act like the owners of the church, forgetting that we are merely tenant caretakers, then violence is done in Jesus' name. When we see our congregations as only for certain types of people and not for others, that too is violence done. When we are afraid to talk about what's going on in the world, afraid to stand up for the oppressed in Jesus' name, afraid of making waves, that too is violence done. And when we, in the ELCA, are part of the whitest denomination in the U.S., but we just wring our hands and pray and authorize another task force on diversity, and nothing changes, that too is violence done. Some of you I know have started reading the book, Dear Church, by Lenny Duncan. He is an ELCA pastor who recently moved to our synod and is starting a new mission congregation in, down in Vancouver in partnership with Messiah Lutheran Church. Pastor Lenny, who is an African-American, writes about his love for the ELCA and Lutheran theology and about our failure as a denomination to recognize our complicity in structures of white supremacy that keep people of color from feeling fully welcome here in our spaces. This book is a hard read for white folks, even super liberal ones, but it is necessary. Pastor Lenny has now started a campaign to create an endowment fund within the ELCA for reparations, financial restitution for the descendants of enslaved Africans. He's calling his movement hashtag defund churchwide. Much like the defund the police movement, he's asking the ELCA to take a good long look at where our money goes and what priorities that shows. Are we truly doing all we can to support and uphold the voices of black, brown, and indigenous people in our tradition? Or are we more concerned about stewardship themes and nice office spaces uh, and our head offices and marketing and feel-good tweets. This parable, I think, illustrates what Pastor Lenny is trying so hard to make all of us in the ELCA see, that we too have forgotten that we are the caretakers of God's vineyard, not the owners. And we are doing everything in our power without even knowing it or realizing it, to keep things exactly how they are, how they are working now, because they work just fine for the majority of us. I think we all know that in our world, in our society, in our church, we are in a time of reckoning. As someone reminded me in Bible study this week, we're about due for another reformation. They tend to happen about every 500 years after all. What if this reformation, this time around, wasn't about building or growing or splitting or a theological debate or getting bigger and better and stronger or more important? What if this reformation was about surrendering? Letting go, giving up our power and privilege, offering up that which we hold most dear for the sake of our neighbor. And how might 
you. And yes, I mean you who's watching this right now. How might you start that process? Maybe it's picking up a book like Dear Church that will challenge you to your core. Maybe it's donating to the work being done by people of color on your behalf in order to change the world. Maybe it's being brave and going to the next protest or demonstration despite those shaking knees and nervous gut. Maybe if you're a stockholder, it's holding those CEOs accountable and letting them know that you value people over profits. And you know what for sure it is, what for sure you can do very, very, very soon? Get out there and vote. Because remember, we are merely tenant farmers of this, care ta of this world, of our church, of all that is in it. And may we remember that always and live accordingly. Thanks be to God. Amen.